To explore the optimal architecture of FPGAs in the new AI era, I conducted hundreds of tests and did in-depth horizontal reviews of 11 different FPGAs at two process nodes. It turns out that the very small design change can bring significant improvements, which is I recently got a message from one of my subscribers saying that when I first watched your video, you only have a few thousand subscribers, but now you have hundreds of thousands. Well, the reason is very simple, right? My old subscriber knows that this channel was originally all about FPGAs, but later I made more videos about chip, AI, and hardcore technologies. So the FPGA contents is getting less and less, but the subscribers are increasing. But as an FPGA engineer, I've always been a firm supporter of FPGAs. It is a special high-performance semi-custom chip, which is the fundamental building blocks for communications, aerospace, and healthcare, etc. However, with the continuous outbreak of AI technologies, everyone is now focusing more on the absolute computing power of GPUs and AI-specific chips, rather than the balance between computing and power consumption of FPGAs. I've written a best-selling book, The Unique Advantages of FPGAs in the Era of AI, but now the advantages written in this book do not seem to be really reflected which makes me rather confused, right? Does FPGA still have advantages in the AI era at all? It was not until the end of last year when I went to Australia to attend FPT 2024, a top academic conference in the FPGA area, and attend a talk given by Professor Yu Wang of Tsinghua University. Then I suddenly realized that FPGAs should not compete directly against the GPUs for AI. The unique advantages of FPGAs should be more reflected at the edge. In particular, the emergence of DeepSeq has almost single-handedly changed change the development of large models from focusing more on training to inference, which brought new opportunities to FPGAs. So how will FPGA develop in the AI era, and what kind of FPGA architecture will be better suited for edge AI applications, while still balancing performance, area, and power to address all the requirements? So I haven't talked about FPGAs for a long time, so in this video, I will not only explain all these issues to you in detail, but also use hundreds of experiments and tests to fully verify the conclusions. So be prepared for today's hardcore video, but I'm sure it's gonna be very helpful. So let's first talk about Professor Yuan's viewpoint. What are the three development phases of FPGAs in the AI era? So this will be of great inspiration for us to choose the optimal FPGA architecture. So the first phase, also known as the AI 1.0, was when FPGA were firstly used for custom acceleration for specific neural networks, such as CNN, DNN, STLM, and systolic array. So the first principle thinking behind it was to directly utilize the customizability of FPGAs, and by changing the logical function of FPGAs through hardware programming, it can be used as a hardware accelerator for AI algorithms. A very representative example of this phase is DeFi technology, which is actually co-founded by Professor Yuan himself, engaged in FPGA DNN acceleration and applied in machine vision and cameras. So eventually, DeFi was acquired by FPGA giant Xilinx for about $300 million. However, at this phase, FPGAs are still used as a hardware accelerator, which means that different models and applications still require different accelerators' architectures. Therefore, the applications are not very flexible. So this brings us to the AI 2.0, which converts different modalities into token processing, and then uses a unified foundation models, or LLMs, based on the transformer architecture to do various things without the need for neural networks. This scenario is very suitable to be accelerated by GPUs for higher performance, which in turn drives the rapid development of GPUs. For example, from 2018 to 2024, the computing power of GPUs has increased by 15.8 times, whereas FPGAs only increased by 2.8 times. However, in AI 2.0, FPGA still has its unique advantages. For example, in large language models, GPUs are better at handling computing-intensive tasks, such as prefill operations, while FPGAs are better at doing storage-intensive tasks, such as decode operations. Many teams are actually working on this, and this is a highly competitive field. So the emergence of DeepSeq has quickly brought AI development into the 3.0 era, which is to shift from model training to low-cost model inference. Particularly, there will be more devices equipped with large models at the edge, such as AI PCs, robots, and autonomous driving. These applications will not only pursue extreme performance like LLM training, nor will they be as simple as possible. They will consider performance, area, and cost as a whole. This actually means new opportunities for FPGAs, and it will even bring about 
well some subversions of traditional FPGA combination. For example, the test I will introduce later in this video demonstrate that some FPGA architectures that were originally designed for high performance are actually better than the traditional low-cost designs. So when considering the several factors mentioned above, let's talk about it in more detail now. The core and the most basic architecture of FPGA is actually the lookup table LUT. LUT is essentially a small truth table that can directly output the corresponding result according to the input combination. In each FPGA, there are thousands of lookup tables, which is the fundamental reason why FPGA can implement hardware programming and change the logic architecture. The architecture of the lookup tables is also directly related to the key factors such as performance, power, and area. So for this reason, the architecture of FPGA or lookup tables is constantly changing, especially the number of inputs. A lot with more inputs normally means it, it can implement more complex logic functions. For example, a 4 input lot can implement any 4 variable boolean function, while a 6 input lot can handle more complex 6 variable logic functions. So in the last century, the lookup tables of FPGAs are basically 3 inputs, and then 4 input become mainstream, then many high-end FPGAs such as AMD's Vertex series would use a 6 input lot architecture. The industry consensus has always been that 6 input lots are mainly used in the high-end market, while for the edge and the cost-optimized FPGAs, many manufacturers still use 4 input LUTs. Interestingly, it is not because these applications do not require higher performance, but because people cannot justify the cost to upgrade to 6 input. However, the question is, does this mean that the 4 input LUTs are the optimal architecture for the edge applications with small and medium-sized design sizes? So to investigate this problem, I found 30 open-source cheap hardware designs, all of which were within 200,000 logic units, and I conducted a comprehensive evaluation of 5 mainstream small and medium-sized FPGAs at 28nm and 16nm process nodes from perspectives of area, maximum frequency, and power. So the conclusion is, for the same design, LAT6 FPGA architecture saves 40% of area compared to the LAT4 FPGAs and has a performance improvement and with a power consumption reduction of up to 46%. Honestly, it's a bit subversive to traditional combination, right? Next, I will elaborate on specific test designs and results. Round 1 so regarding the area comparison, I just threw 30 designs into the FPGA design tools of AMD, Lattice, and Altera respectively. Then obtained the area utilization data after mapping, placing, and routing. And then finally took the geometric mean of the area data of each FPGA device. It can be seen that compared with the LAT4 architecture used by Lattice, AMD's LAT6 architecture can achieve an error reduction of about 40%. This shows that although LAT4 itself is optimized for area, it is not as advantageous as LAT6 for the small and medium-sized designs. I think there are two possible reasons. Right? One is that LAT6 itself can accommodate more complex logic than LAT4, so for the same design, it can achieve a smaller area. So the other reason may be that AMD's Vivado tool is better optimized and can map the design more efficiently using smaller area. So from another perspective, this means that the same design can be implemented within a smaller LAT6 based FPGA chip. So in this case, not only will the chip be smaller, but it will also bring lower cost and power therefore achieving a win-win situation. But does this mean that the more LAT inputs, the better? Not really. Altera's Cyclone 5 FPGA now uses a very special 8 input LUT. So I compare Cyclone 5 and Arctic 7, which are both based on 28 nanometer process. It turns out that the LUT 6 has an obvious area advantages. For example, Cyclone 5 uses 1612 LUT 8s for this design, while Arctic 7 only uses 1516 LUT 6. So a single LUT 8 should be able to obtain more complex logic than LUT 6, but eventually more area was used, which means that either Altera's LM unit is not fully optimized, or the Quartus 2 is not fully optimized, or unfortunately both. So in short, in terms of area, LAT6 gets one point. Round 2 A very important factor in measuring FPGA performance is the maximum frequency, Fmax, i.e. how fast a design can run. So to find a certain design's maximum frequency, we can continuously increase the largest frequency value in the timing constraint and then run it in the FPGA tool until a timing violation occurs. Then the maximum frequency without timing violation is the Fmax of this design. As with the area test, for each FPGA, I used the both test method to obtain the maximum frequency of 30 designs and then took the geometric 
geometric mean to obtain the f max of this FPGA. I put the results on the screen so you can pause and take a screenshot. It can be seen that at a 28 nanometer process, AMD's RTX 7 FPGAs and the latest Nexus 9HP have basically the same performance. But at a 16 nanometer process, AMD's last 6 FPGAs, even the slowest low power version of AU7P, is nearly 30% faster than the latest fastest dash 3 speed grade Avant FPGA based on the LAT4 microarchitecture under the same process. So not to mention AMD's faster RTX FPGAs. There is also an interesting perspective to, to interpret these results. That is, the fastest speed grade of lattice Avant FPGA is about 29% faster than the slowest speed grade, which means that AMD's LAT6 FPGA is two speed grade higher than lattice LAT4 FPGA. In other words, the same performance standard can be achieved with a smaller, low-cost and low-power AMD FPGA. So if we look at the FMAX at each design, we can see that AMD FPGA are faster than lattice in almost all designs. Using the same manufacturing process, the performance is significantly improved. In addition to the architecture difference of the lookup table, it is largely due to the FPGA development tool. In other words, Vivado has done a better job in design optimization, mapping, and placing and routing which can potentially fully utilize the architectural advantages of FPGAs for higher performance. Round 3 Now let's look at the power consumptions of different architectures. FPGA chips have two types of power consumption, dynamic power and static power. Dynamic power refers to the power consumed during operation, which is directly related to the design itself, the size of the occupied area, and the frequency. Static power is consumed by the chip in the idle state, which is related to the factors such as the manufacturing process of the FPGA itself, chip size, operating temperature, and voltages. So generally speaking, the power consumption of FPGA is not measured directly by measuring the current and the voltages of the board, but is estimated by the tools. FPGA manufacturers also provide uh, corresponding power consumption estimation tools such as AMD's XP, PDM, and Lattice Radian Toolkit. So to reasonably evaluate the power consumption of FPGAs with different architectures under the same design, I first assume that Lattice FPGA's resources utilization rate reaches 80%. Then, based on the conclusions from the previous tests, AMD FPGA can achieve a 40% area reduction under the same design to obtain a similar area. Then I use this data in their respective power estimation tools to check the results. Notice that I set the reduction here to be limited to LUT and try to maintain a reasonably comparison. So for other resources such as BRAM, DSP, I.O., etc., I assume that they remain unchanged. But doing so is actually a disadvantage to AMD, because if we use a smaller FPGA, all these hardware resources will also be reduced. But we just skip the details there. So from the results, we can see, even with this assumption, AMD FPGA have obvious advantages in power consumptions over lattice. For example, at 150 MHz, both Arctic 7 and Arctic Ultrascope Plus can significantly reduce power compared to Lattice LAT4 FPGA. So if you want to continue to pursue lower power, you can also use AMD's Kintex Ultrascope Plus FPGA. For example, I also tried the KU5P low power series of the Kintex series. Kintex itself is a high-performance mid-range FPGA, so it was not included in the previous comparisons. But its low-power version sacrificed some performance in exchange for lower power. In fact, it can also be compared with the FPGAs mentioned above. So compared with Lattice Avant series, it is found that it is not only has lower dy dynamic power, but also very low static power. This is related to Kintex chip packaging process, which can achieve better heat dissipation. This also means that under the same conditions, devices using lattice may need to add additional heat sinks or even fans, while AMD devices such as Kintex do not need them, thereby further reducing costs. In fact, in addition to Arctix and Kintex mentioned above, AMD also has a type of cost-optimized FPGAs called Spartan, which was explained in detail in a previous video linked down below. At present, UltraScale Plus architecture based on LAT6 has been integrated into all these FPGAs. So Spartan is more for scenarios with high requirements for cost and power, while Arctix is mid-range, focusing on the balance of performance, area, power, and cost. These are all all pure FPGAs, and there's also a category of SOCs that integrate one or more ARM cores into the FPGAs, such as AMD's Zinc series, which can take into account the control capabilities of CPUs and the parallel computing capabilities of FPGAs. 
It is suitable for scenarios of software and hardware co-design, very suitable for many edge applications. I also have a video before about making a robotic arm based on the Zinc device and open sourced it. The link is also in the comment section down below. So if you find it interesting, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. It drives me to do better contents. So let's go back to the question at the beginning of this video. What is the unique advantages of FPGA in the AI era? I think it still lies in the balance between performance, power, and customizability of FPGAs, which is exactly why FPGA chips appeared decades ago in the first place. The explosion of large language models has brought an explosion of computing power, perhaps sacrifice cost and power to exchange for extreme high performance. Because whoever trains a larger model with more parameters first will have the upper hand in this competition. However, as the development of LLMs and AI technologies into the second half, people find that this unlimited demand for computing power could not be expanded indefinitely. It is like the emperor's new clothes, but everyone is unwilling to admit it and has no way to solve it. At this time, DeepSeek has become the little boy who revealed the secret. It brought about a reduction in computing and cost while not reducing the demand for computing power. Instead, it would bring more computing power requirements such as edge and inference, and it also needed to consider the area, power, and cost, which is the true value for FPGAs. As mentioned in this video, a simple architectural optimization can bring new advantages to FPGAs in the new applications. Perhaps a new spring for FPGAs is actually coming. So what do you think about the future of FPGAs in the AI era? Please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. So that's all for today's video. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.